Welcome to AEC Unscripted M&A Edition, your go-to podcast for unfiltered conversations and expert analysis. Brought to you by Stan Bonness. Welcome to AEC Unscripted. I'm your host, Jeff Adams, the Director of Mergers and Acquisitions at Stanbaugh Ness. Today, we're going to be exploring M&A through the lens of an experienced private equity-backed strategic buyer. I'm delighted to have joining me for this episode, Ernesto Aguilar, the CEO of Adura Group. Ernesto has been the President and CEO of Adura since 2018, where he's been the driving force behind its remarkable growth from 230 employees in 11 office in 2017 to now having over 1,750 employees in 85 offices. Much of this growth has been accomplished through an acquisition strategy that included nearly 30 acquisitions. Ardura is currently listed as number 86 on ENR's top 500 list and number 147 on ENR's top 150 global design firms list. Ernesto previously served as the Chief Operating Officer at NV5 and as a Senior Vice President at Atkins, and even founded and sold his own engineering firm. He holds a degree in civil engineering from Concordia University and resides in Boston. Ernesto, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, thank you, Jeff. It's an honor to be here. Appreciate the invite. Hey, the honor's all mine, Ernesto. Looking forward to talking with you today and letting others be able to just kind of uh, learn more about you and Ardura and what you guys have been doing. So, Ernesto, before we really get started, tell us how your career began. You mentioned where I studied, Jeff. I actually grew up in Canada. Uh, I know people look at me. My first language is actually French, if you can believe it, Jeff. Grew up in Montreal, graduated as a structural engineer. Soon as I got graduated, moved all the way to Vancouver, British Columbia, so on the west coast of Canada, and worked as a structural engineer probably for the first four years of my career. Realized quickly that's not what I wanted to do. Switched more to municipal engineering. Worked a couple of jobs. Over time, decided to start my own business with a partner. And we got into about 35 people. I had lived in Vancouver 10 years. We decided, I met my wife there, decided to move to San Diego. So sold my business. And moved to San a little Diego. Bit warmer weather there in San Diego. Right? Warmer weather, big big difference. The idea was staying back in San Diego one year. We ended up staying twelve. Very hard place to leave, Jeff. Very hard place to leave. And uh, ended up joining a water firm six months after I got there. The firm got acquired by PBS and J. I think a lot of people remember PBS and J. Ended up being a PBS and J slash Atkins for the next fourteen years. Um, lots of uh, roles, a lot of operational kind of sales jobs. When Atkins uh, took over, I decided at that time that I wanted to actually uh, move back to the East Coast. I had my kids in San Diego. We wanted to be closer to family. And Atkins then offered me the opportunity to actually run one of the North American uh, operations. So they said, you can live anywhere. We moved to Boston just to be closer to family. Ended up doing that. And after a while, I had been there a long time, decided to try something new. Joined the firm that was starting up. So I joined the NV5 when there were about 200 employees. And so uh, nobody knew what MV5 was. Uh, I joined them. I think they had no presence in the East Coast. It was all West Coast. And I came in as chief operating officer. And I, I think as many people know, that company exploded. Uh, over the next four years, I think we did have almost 40 acquisitions. Company wow. grew, I think, up to 3,000 employees. Public traded company went through an IPO. And at that time, it was time for me to move on. The company had changed. I learned a lot. There's a lot of things I wanted to do differently. And so there was a company that was starting up. It was Ardura. A colleague of mine from MV5 had actually started a company with PE back. I was interested in PE. This is 2017. And the company that is Ardura had actually started six months before I started talking to the PE guys. And that's how I ended up here. And when I joined, the company had about 200 employees. And that's and I came in as a chief operating officer, did that for a couple of months, and then they offered me to take over. Yeah, that was company. what, 2017, 2018 time frame, right? Of 2018. So the company started in, I probably came about eight, nine months after the company had started, but I had been talking to them six months after that. So that's how I ended up here. 
Wow, that's phenomenal. I mean, uh, you know, NV5's growth story uh, that you were telling about while you were there and now here at Adura, going yeah. from what, 200 to over 1,700 employees now. Uh, yeah. That's that's pretty impressive growth. I think since 2017, you guys have acquired somewhere around 26 to 28 firms, but there was a period of time there that you seemed to slow down, albeit you just recently made a pretty big announcement on an acquisition that you've done. But uh, tell us about this little lull, for lack of a better word, that kind of happened in 2023, early 2024. So let me go back a little bit, Jeff. So between 2017 and 2022, we made 23 acquisitions and then we recapitalized. Okay. So as you know, private equity, every five years or so, they recapitalized. The company had grown tremendously and we got a new partner. So there was a period there where we actually had to reform the company in many ways, put a new foundation. That's what we've been doing. We did do two acquisitions in 2023. Uh, and recently, uh, Jeff, we just announced uh, our most recent acquisition, which is WK Dixon, an iconic 95-year-old company based out of Charlotte, very well known. So we're honored that they have decided to join with and merge with us. So that brought us to about 1,750 employees as of now. Yeah, I mean, that is uh, incredible growth, Ernesto. Uh, how, how did this W.K. Dixon deal come about? Yeah, most most of the companies we actually find, Jeff, are actually not going through processes like bankers or, you know, auctions, if you want to call them. So W.K. Dixon, a lot of people were after them, a lot of people calling them. They were actually not for sale. A, someone that we knew introduced us and they said right away, we're not for sale. And we said, fine, you know, that's how we started talking. and. It took us a year. It took us a year. They decided to go back and forth. They knew they needed to do this eventually. They weren't ready, but you know, it was a good fit from both our sides. And they said, you know what? We weren't looking right now, but we eventually probably had to do this for ownership transition. You guys came along. Let's just do it because we don't want to miss the opportunity. So really that's how it developed. Wow. A small, a small 50 minute conversation turned out to be a merger between the two firms. Well, I, I suppose Ardura uh, keeps a, a pipeline of potential acquisition targets out there at all times that you're able to we, invest we in. We do. We probably talk to or look at between 50 and 100 firms a year. Mm -hmm. We're very, like they should be, we're very selective. Who's going to be part of the Ardura team, just like they should be too. You know, it's kind of sending your kid to college, pick the right college. And so, yes, we do talk. We're very, very selective. We have certain rules that we use to actually find a firm that fits into our culture. And that's how we do it. What does your m and team look like? The people that get involved in, in those type of transactions? Yeah. So in terms of sourcing, a lot of it comes through me. We have a chief uh, strategy officer. He gets, he goes with me a lot to look at these. And then we have all these previous owners that we have in this company. We have over 40 of them. They all have connections. They all have networks. Mm -hmm. They all have companies, they all have people we work with. And that's why many of the companies we have are people that we know already. Um, so that's the sourcing piece. When we actually decide to make a deal, we have a full-time M&A, head of M&A. Okay. And his job is to work through the whole deal process, due diligence. So he takes over, grabs our HR, our finance, our operations, and makes it, works it through. We also have a full-time uh, integration team when they come on board. Integration, we have it into two parts. We have the parts which is just the systems, I call them, finance, HR, that kind of stuff. And then there's the people side. We actually have a full-time person. Her title is the engagement partner. Mm. Her job, she actually sits in their office for a while, make sure they're integrated in, understand who to call when they have questions. But that person actually sits in their office at the beginning, make sure that they're comfortable as we're bringing them in. So that's how we do it. You mentioned that you, you have 50 to 100 firms there in your pipeline at any point in time. You have 40 or so principals from uh, previous acquisitions that have relationships with so many different uh, opportunities out there. How do you go about prioritizing which ones to, to go look at first? So we have this method. It sounds kind of corny, Jeff. It's called the three F rule and it's going to sound corny, but we actually do use it. And actually it's a way for us to kind of be selective of the firms we look at. So mm. let's go quickly through what the three F's are. So the first one's called fit and we call it the beer fit. 
and it's really going out. It's almost like a date, right? You're going out. Do we actually like these people? You use that you know, term all the time uh, with M&A, dating. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, but it's really, we actually are looking at the people. How do they talk about their staff? Do we actually like work with them? Uh, we actually think this guy get along with this person that we have in the company. It's important uh, because when you get through the deal, you're going to come through obstacles. And if you actually have this relationship, you'll be able to go through so much. You'll be able to talk it through. So that's probably over 60% of the deal. Uh, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes we've actually sat with some people. We're saying, yeah, this is not our, this is not our buds. You know, we're going to move on. Mm -hmm. So second F is future. And we say it's one plus one equals 30. Mm. Are we better off? Not two, 30. It's one plus one. Uh, sorry. Is do they have stuff we don't have? Do we have stuff they don't have? Are we better off together? We're looking for firms who want to grow, right? So do we actually have the ability to help them grow? Are they in the same markets we are? Are they in the same geo geography? Or do they fit our strategy? So the fit, the future together has to be way better than we are apart. Otherwise, there's no point. Then the third F is the financials, meaning when we make a deal, the money does come into play. Are they happy with what they're getting? We don't want resentment when they come in. And at the same time as we think it's a fair deal for our shareholders and getting value. So all those three have to work. And we're also not looking for fixer uppers. These companies have to be well run. Uh, they may be looking for reasons. There's always the cash in part, uh, Jeff, that's understood. But we're looking for people who actually wanna, maybe they don't have the capital to grow. They wanna provide opportunities to their employees. These are the firms that we are looking for that we believe we can help and we want them to be our partners. I like that, the three F rule. So fit, yeah. future, and financials. So, right. so let me ask you about, uh, let's just dig deeper into those, each of those a little bit. When you talked about fit, you seem, you know, you mentioned some of the, I'll call them superficial for lack of a better word, but superficial right. type things, you know, do we get along with them? Can we carry on a conversation, yeah. things of that nature? How do you dig deeper on culture? And what kind of attributes do you look for to determine whether or not that target firm will be a good fit inside the Ardura team? You know, I'll give you a quick story, Jeff. We actually, this is many years ago, we actually talked to this firm and the owner, uh, we just didn't have the same personalities, I'll call it. But it's almost like dating. The company was incredible, but we did not, the leadership did not fit with us. We said, we can change them. We can change them. Some of our guys, you know, it's almost like, a, it's really like a date. So we went to the second date. No, same thing. Mm -hmm. Then I actually went to the third one and realized this is not a fit. So really you have to be true to yourself, even though sometimes you're in love with that company, uh, it may not be the right fit. So what are we looking for? You know, we, we feel we, the way we run our company, we have very low turnover, Jeff, extremely low turnover in our company. We let the employees, they actually come up with the benefits. They actually come up with all the programs at the company. That's part of what they, come, all the employees are forming this company. So we're looking for companies that treat the employees the same way. I know everybody says that they care of the employee, but we really take it seriously. Mm -hmm. It's an acquisitive company. So generally acquisitive companies, the theory is they have a lot of turnover because people get worried and we like to fight that theory. And so the companies we're looking for are people that have a culture. Our job is not to go change their culture but they take care of their employees and do not have a high turnover rate. They value the employees and service they provide to their clients. And so we do ask a lot of questions. We do look at what they do. We do talk to their staff below when we're doing the deal to see what they feel about their leadership. So that's how we do it. Okay, good. When you were talking about um, just the way you go in and look at different people I've, and the first date, the second date, I've heard, it reminded me of this saying I've heard before, when people show you who they are, believe them. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and I think sometimes we're like, oh, no, I, I, we could change it. We can make it different. It, we can get caught up in that. I call it the, the M&A game, the competition of it all. And it can get a little over enthusiastic, but it's good that you're able to sit back and just kind of reassess that and think, wait a minute, is this really going to be a good fit for us or not? Yeah, I'll tell you another little story, Jeff. It's kind of a little bit to this nature, but it's a little bit funny, but it's actually, uh, if you'll find it interesting. So this is not that long ago. We actually made, there was a firm that really had two owners, some older that needed to retire and some younger. And it was pretty obvious that the, young, the younger generation did not necessarily want to sell. 
but they could not buy out the mm. older owners. But they, they talked to them and they came back and said, no, we're ready to move forward. So we went under LOI, started the deal, started the process, and it was very slow. And it came, became pretty obvious that the younger team that was on board was not on board. They did not necessarily want to sell. So I called them and I said, look, I give you a proposal. I give you a ring, i.e. I, I, the, the LOI. You accepted my proposal. I've been trying to set a wedding date that we can get married and you keep putting it off. And this person looked at me, we're not ready. You, you're not ready to settle down. You still want to be young and have fun. And the person said, you're right. I, I, it actually hits home. But we actually ended the, ended the deal because of that. We yeah. said, be true to yourself. You're not ready to sell the firm. And they initially thought, is this, uh, you know, are you trying to talk us into? No, 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 you're not ready. And, and that's it. We actually shake hands, stay friends, and went our separate ways. So this part, I know uh, dating is used to the cliche quite a bit, but it is like that. It is like that. Well, and the way you left things, I'm sure that firm could potentially be a future That's uh, right. seller yeah. that, that you guys yeah. acquire. But uh, they, left yeah. their love. they left a long time love. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we see that frequently, quite honestly, where there's firms where the, the majority owner wants to think and sell, doesn't see the, the opportunity for an internal transaction to take place for various reasons. But then the, those minority leaders or that second generation to be owners just are less than enthusiastic when they get in, involved in it. And the buyers realize that. And what, yeah. what would you say to sellers? I think that's one of those things that sellers need to focus on when they're preparing for sale. What would, what, what's your advice to a seller? I think the sellers need to decide what they actually want to be, meaning what kind of partner do they want? I would advise them not to go just for the money. This is uh, many times you're actually, this is going to be your life going forward. You don't want to be stuck with a partner just because they have the highest price. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, so that's number one. And I actually advise them to ask questions. So what is, when I'm getting into what's going to look like? Some firms, I'll, I'll give you, I'll use WK Dixon, which is our latest one. They actually came down and met with three of our previous companies we acquired. They wanted to know how did it go? How did the process go? They actually met with each one and asked, how was the integration alone? We weren't part of it. And so they did their homework. They wanted to make sure their staff, it was going to be a good fit for them. We like that. We like that because we think these, this company's taking this very seriously, wants to make sure it's a good fit for them too, which will make it a good fit for us. So do your homework. If you're not ready, don't do it. People think sometimes they have to do it or part of it. You got to be ready. You should have no regrets. How, there's the other advice. Don't wait too long. There is a point where some owners wait too long and it's all about people. Those relations are going to be gone. They don't have a long time frame, and the value of a company is not going to be the same. So have a plan, right? Don't wait to the very end. Have a plan of what you want to do and do it. Yeah, that's some great yeah. advice, Ernesto. So would, would, when you look at firms thinking in the past, would you say you've always assessed culture correctly? Have you gotten it right every time? We, we got it. There's one or two in my career, Jeff. And you I don't have to name involved. names. No <laughs> names. One or two that that what happened is uh, the firm, it turned out okay, but the leader struggled initially of not being the boss, you know, and could make the decisions. Mm -hmm. But we got around it. Other than that, it's been we've been very fortunate in this company that it has worked out. So we our work, our apps have worked. And we've been very careful about it. So I could see we've been pretty successful in all the firms we have acquired so far. Okay. Well, let's talk about the second F. For, so future. You mentioned that you like for one plus one to equal thirty. You yeah. Know, I've, I've always said let's make it one plus one equal something greater than two. Thirty is a big yeah. number. It uh, is. How do you guys go about assessing that? What are you looking for? So when we actually ask this firm, this is what we tell them and we ask them. When they started their companies, many of these owners, they had these grandiose plans and then reality hits. Payroll, accounting, taxes, the back office, they can't do all the stuff they mm -hmm. had grandiose plans. So what we tell them is, what were your grandiose plans? Can you put them on a piece of paper? Because mm -hmm. now... 
we might be able to make those grandiose plans come true. So tell us, we do that before. Tell us what is it what you want it to be. And that's part of it. We are not looking for companies that actually do not want to grow. I'll be honest with you, that's just not our DNA. So we look at their plans, what they have, and then we see, can we actually do that? Are they realistic? It's something within our strategy. And if the answer is yes, there's the what one plus one equals 30. The way the company has been growing, this is going to sound weird what I want to say. M&A to me is a lazy way of growing. Don't get me wrong. It's worked for us. Organic growth is the way to go. And we've been very good. Our organic growth is double digits, no less than 15%. But M&A is a way to accelerate organic growth. So you got to be careful. We look at these firms and say, can we grow organically if we make some investments? If we bring certain people in, make small acquisitions, tuck-ins, are they going to explode? And that's the one plus one equals 30. So we do assess that before we actually close the deal. I, I like that, Ernesto. I mean, you know, it, it's uh, very appealing thinking as a seller, I would think, hearing that, okay, I was, I'm not able to achieve the growth goals and dreams that I had for my firm, but here's a firm, Ardura, that is willing to acquire me to help me achieve my dreams. Um, and, and Jeff, obviously they'll get some money out of it. Right. All these entrepreneurs that started their companies, they started for a reason. And most of them is because they had a vision of what they wanted to be, but reality does hit. It's not as easy as you may think. So here it is. Let's accomplish those dreams that you had. And when you have someone that's bought in or a, a champion, things are going to happen. To me, this company has been built because of champions. This company, and honestly, Jeff, we, I made one acquisition in this company that I really was so, so about it, but the employees in this company were so much into it. I said, well, we're going to do it because there's so much, and guess what? It's actually tripled. Wow. And why? Because we had champions here in the company that were going to make it work. So that's the way it works. Organic growth works, just empowering people, having champions, they'll take it. I was, that's what I was about to say. That's what empowering yeah. people looks like. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. How do you think about the owner? So you mentioned them a little earlier, but you know, you, you can have your majority owner. Uh, and you, you mentioned earlier, your advice was don't wait too late, have a plan. Um, how do you deal with owners that are coming in with retirement plans? You know, I want to, I really want to be done in two years or what, what does that do? So, Jeff, uh, incredibly, I think all the owners of all the companies we acquire are still here, except for one. Wow. And, and that was a planned exit. Many of the ones said they were going to retire. They've decided to stay longer. They're having a lot of fun. Now, incredibly, all these guys can leave. I mean, they've made enough uh, money to be able to leave. But they're here because they love what they're doing. They see it's fun. We do have a fun group. They want to see their employees, that they still part of their their family. So yeah, we, we've been very fortunate. Now, there are firms where they tell us up front, look, this person's going to leave and all that. And we understand that. Like I said, we've been fortunate. They've actually, nah, I'm not ready to retire. I'll keep on going. And we're fine with that. Knock on wood here, Jeff. They're all still here. All from all the 27 companies, we can believe it. Yeah, that's quite an accomplishment. Yeah. So your third F, financials. Um, how do you go about assessing their financials? What are you looking for in particular? Yeah, so... I see you mentioned, Jeff, we're private equity backed. So as a private equity backed company, we have what's called a quality of earnings. Mm -hmm. So we do have to get a third party. The banks require it for us to, for, for loans. We do go through a process where we hire an outside third party to review their financials. So to make sure that they're straight, how they do their work. We then do a uh, due diligence as well on their business, looking at their contracts, that kind of stuff. But that's how we look at the financials. We will never, ever acquire a fixer-upper. If you cannot run your own business, then you're never going to be able to do it here. So that, that's how we assess their kind of their financials, see how they're doing, how they run their businesses. And if we feel they know how to do that kind of stuff, we're willing to invest in them. Mm. So on the quality of earnings, have you ever had a, a firm that fit, check, future, check, financials, put on the brakes? I mean, yes, twice. Once is the company had dropped off when we started the LOI, but they lost some big jobs. We told them we couldn't move forward if they wanted to renegotiate, which we did. That was the only time once. 
Uh, and they said, yeah, we understand. And they, we still went forward, but at a different, a different price. The other one is the financials dropped off dramatically. They lost some jobs and we decided not to move forward. But that's the only times I can think of in my career, Jeff, that we have not moved forward on financials. Sometimes when you're, sometimes when you're looking at companies that do not have a process, a process easier, a, a bank run advisor to help them put financials together so they're more ready. But some of these smaller companies, they may not have all the stuff we need up front. So we have to work with them to get it there. So those are a little bit hum companies, a little bit harder to assess on their financials, but it has happened. It has happened. Uh, I'm not saying it hasn't. Do, do you find that uh, as a result of the quality of earnings, you have adjustments to the purchase price or maybe no, more changes to reps and warranties or? Yeah, we, we don't do it that way. Usually we go in with, this is our price. You're always going to be off a little bit, even if it's down about 10, 15%, we're okay with it, depending on what we can do with it. So we don't retrade. I don't think the only time I told you is once because it had gone dramatically. So we don't like doing that. It's, there's not a retrade. We're just guaranteeing that it's close to what they said it was going to be doing. Reps and warranties. Sometimes we may find a contract, Jeff, where they have some uh, risk. Mm -hmm. Which we have a little bit closer and we might put something in the contract, say, depending on what happens here, here's how, how, how we're going to deal with it. But other than that, Jeff, we've been very very good. Like I said, we don't retrade. The price is what it is. And we've been going forward with that. All right. Great. Yeah, one last question on financials. Do, do you ever have challenges with sellers that have unrealistic financial expectations or value valuation expectations? Um, we haven't moved forward then <laughs> because there, there's no first fit, right? The first, the first F. Sure, everybody thinks their company's worth more than it is. I think we do very fair. We explain what it is. We don't want someone coming in with resentment, Jeff. So that's part of the financials at the very end. If they don't, we don't want, if they don't feel good about it, then don't do it. Don't do it. And so we will actually not move forward to someone that's actually not feeling good about it because they're going to come here not feeling good about it. What's the point? Uh, so, absolutely. so that is, yes, there are firms who find to have unrealistic expectations. I think the market though, in the last couple of years, Jeff has a better understanding. I mean, it's out there. Everybody's out there. Valuations have gone up. I mean, this is a very, very hot market right now. And so uh, they're still unrealistic, but I think there's a lot more benchmarks out there that people can look at too. That's right. Any funny <laughs> stories that you got that you just want to share, uh, or whether it's just things that happen along the way or mistakes maybe you made in the, in the process? Anything come to mind? Make plenty of mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some of them are, I, I mean, I told you one earlier about the, 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 the person that we actually explained to them on a date and she said, I get it. I've been through that before personally, you know, <laughs> uh, but there are funny stories sometimes you're, as you're going through the kind of the process, unfortunately, sometimes you find that we've also find bad, sad things. We find that maybe an accountant's actually been stealing money from them. And through in the QOB, we find out and we have to tell them, you know, so not funny, but it's actually that person has been with you 20 years and they've been taking a little bit of money every year. What? So that's happened to me twice. And the QOB wow. found that out. And so it's kind of eye opening sometimes how people react when we find a lot of stuff that's going on in their business. They didn't know about it. Some good, some bad, you know. So. Yeah, you know, that's not exactly what you you go into a Q of E expecting to find, right? No, you know, no. Cover some fraud going on no, in the organization. No, like, no. Wow. We, we've had a. I've seen ridiculous. I've seen once a company, uh, a couple of employees. They actually had major expenses on haircuts, and we thought that was weird. And it turns out they had a spreadsheet of uh, percentage of time they spend in the office. And they charged it to the company because that the haircuts were meant to bring more business in. And we were, I've never seen anything like that, Jeff. Wow. Some of these spreadsheets and a whole bunch of employees to actually do this on expense. So they had a haircut expense. I don't know if you've ever <laughs> seen that, Jeff, but I've never seen that. I've never <laughs> seen that either. Yeah. 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 Wow. So, yeah. so what, what advice would you have for buyers out there? Whether they're, they're firms that have, have tried it before or they're just considering being a buyer for the first time and getting into the M&A game. Yeah. You know, one fear I do have right now, Jeff, there is, I think when we started in 2017, there was probably 10 
platforms at the most, platforms meaning private equity backed platforms. What I understand, there's over 100 now. Mm -hmm. There's over 100 platforms. And I think it's enticing for a buyer, especially to go to a company and say, we are going to become our platform. And to these companies, oh, that's cool. We're going to be able to. And then what happens is the PE company expects these companies to grow and do acquisitions. And if you've never done acquisitions before in your life, they're going to be on you. They don't understand. You know, I've had a couple of those guys call me. How do you do that? Well, I'm not going to tell you. Our experience is a little bit different. So be careful what it sounds good if you actually can do it. Um, I think there's a lot of one and dones on the P. I think you're going to see uh, a lot of swallowing happening here. There's some firms that have been around four years, haven't been able to make an acquisition. Or what happens is when a firm comes out through a process, they all jump, everybody jumps on it. So be careful what sounds enticing and be real. Can you actually be a platform that's going to compete mm -hmm. against 100 others? So that to me is one advice. I've been seeing firms are saying, you're not a platform, but I know it sounds cool. Just be careful what you're getting into. Uh, so, so that's right now on the private equity side. I would say be careful what you're getting into, what you're selling into. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that, that's a great word there, Ernesto. Yeah, it's appealing, right? It's, it's kind of like, or it makes me think about when I was a kid being out on the on the basketball uh, floor, you know, and you're, when you're picking teams, got a captain out there picking. It's always fun to be that first one chosen, right? It makes you feel special and all that. And that's kind of what this platform concept is. But uh, there, there's a there's a lot of back end reality to that. That if you haven't already been doing all those things that's required to successfully grow as yeah. a firm, then uh, it's going to be a rough ride for you as the platform. Yeah. Alternatively, being being an, an add on or a bolt on to a platform firm, totally different, right? You already have that leadership team, that know how when it comes to uh, uh, rapid growth, and like you mentioned, your whole team that you have internally. Uh, can help you through that process. So yeah, think, uh, you can just go on in yeah. on that and add your relationship capital to the to the fire and re really that be additional fuel. So and be part of the team that you're going to grow it too. It's not like um, it's just going to be kind of uh, sitting there. You're actually part of a team that's growing. I'm just saying, just be careful that you know what you're getting into, the expectations from these private equity companies. Mm -hmm. I just find there's way, in my opinion, way too many right now. And so it'll be interesting what happens here in the next couple of years. Uh, there can only be so many. And there's a point where it's going to be, one's going to start eating the others. And I think that's just starting to happen already. That's just starting to happen. Yeah. So I want to switch gears real quickly here as we're, as we're getting toward the end. But I, I want to ask you about, I believe, I can't remember if you called it relationship capital person, your integration person. You got this key mm -hmm. integration person. Yes. Tell, what, what was the title of that? Employee engagement partner. Employee engagement partner. So uh, tell me a little bit, how does the, when does the employee engagement partner come into the M&A process, first of all? So when we're actually going through the diligence, we actually start looking at each employee before we close, how they're going to be, because we have to see if we have to need to gross up their salaries. So one mm -hmm. thing we do, Jeff, is no employee will be worse off. So as an example is, Let's say our benefits are better, but that in company pays more of the benefits of their portion. Mm -hmm. We actually gross up the salaries. Okay. So even though either they're going to be the same or better, not worse, the same or better. So as we start actually giving that message, that person starts getting involved. When we actually start doing the roadshow, we start introducing ourselves, that person takes a big lead. And I said, at the end, she's going to be ended up staying there. So it happens before a close job. When we actually go to introduce the company, she's involved in it and talks about the people side. So it's pretty, again, all this happens before we even close a deal to make sure we're getting into. And so they understand they have someone they can rely on to ask questions through the process. Yeah, I, I think I run into buyers from time to time that I think they really struggle. You know, struggle might be a wrong word. You, you get focused on the deal, on the transaction yeah. and forget there's this day one integration that you need to already have figured out before day one gets here. Right. And I, I think your employment engagement team can sit here and identify what the challenges, the, the hurdles, the concerns are that the uh, employees coming in might have and address those early on. My assumption, Jeff, when, when people hear the word, we've been acquired, 
they hear nothing else except in their mind, it's my job on the line. Mm -hmm. That is my assumption. We go in with that assumption and it's, it's normal. You're touching their livelihood. They worry about it. They hear bad stories, big, bad private equity, big, bad acquisition. So what we say is, look, you don't know, you don't know me from Adam, you know, you don't trust your leadership, but don't go do something irrational. Wait it out to see what happens. Right? You're going to get a lot of calls from recruiters telling you, oh, this is bad and all that. Wait it out. Just you'll see that not a lot of things will change. We never say nothing's going to change, Jeff, because that's not true. Things will change a little bit. And so wait it out, and this person here is going to be able to help you. And then you can make a, a decision, an informed decision. And so that's the way we approach it. We just tell them it's normal. Give us a chance. But we don't try to change their mind. We're just saying give it time. And that's how we do it. And then she's there to support them if they have questions. Well, Ernesto, I think there's a, a lot people have heard here today that already answers this question, but I'm going to ask you this question and let you as the CEO tell us why Ordura. All right. So, you know, Jeff, I tell people I don't have a sales pitch. And I'll tell you why I say that. And because this is, again, it's back to dating. I don't want to force one to marry me, you know, because I sound good. I think we're not, we're not the only people out there, Jeff. I think you need to find your, uh, do I, I have a, obviously I have a biased view of our company. So I think I'm not going to make the sales pitch for our door. I think the sales pitch on selling the company is that be real, be real when the timing is there. Don't wait too long. Make a decision, not about money, find your right partner. Your private partner, it could be a polytrated company. It could be a, pri a private equity company. The decision might be that you want to stay on your own because and you, want, you have a, a succession plan. But have a plan. Do not just wait to the last minute. And so I'm not going to give, that's my sales pitch on how you should progress and uh, pick the right partner. Well, Ernesto, I really appreciate it. You got a lot of wisdom in your words that, that you gave us today and, and your experiences that you've gone through. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today. A pleasure, Jeff. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And thank you for tuning in to AEC Unscripted, the Mergers and Acquisition Edition. I'm Jeff Adams, and it's been a pleasure guiding you through M&A from the perspective of an experienced private equity-backed strategic buyer in the AEC industry. Please remember to subscribe and leave us a review wherever you get your podcast. And until next time, keep pushing forward.